Are you a snow contractor? Are you considering using brine but not sure if it's good or not, if you're going to lose profits? How it works? When to use it? Today on the show, I have Jordan Smith, and he's an expert in this from VSI Innovations and Boss Snow Clouds. He's going to be answering all these questions. We're even going to be talking about live scraping edges and the benefits and the combo of the two. You don't want to miss this episode. You're listening to the Blue Collar Business Owner Podcast, a podcast that helps business owners grow as leaders to improve navigating cash, cash. people, and process. This show is brought to you by the Blue Collar Business Coach. Reduce the weight on your shoulders as a business owner by implementing the scaling scoreboard. Improve your cash, people, and processes by using front leading metrics. Go to bluecollarbusinesscoach.net to calculate instantly in dollars our scoreboard's impact for your business. Let the show begin. Hey, Jordan, welcome to the show. How are you today? Good. How are you, Seth? Terrific. So what's what's going on in your world today? How's the weather? Where are you located? Yeah, so I'm here in uh, southern Minnesota, Mankato, Minnesota, to be exact. And uh, we actually have our first plowable uh, snow event. Started started yesterday, but it's going to be wrapping up uh, this evening. I think we're expecting around four inches of snow. So crews are out doing their thing. Um you know, our, our, our snow contracting crews are kind of where my whole journey in, in the snow business started and, and kind of where everything else came from. Yeah. So just walk us through your journey, uh, where, where you started and to where you are today and what you're involved in. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'd say that I would call that my, uh, startup story, the fairly typical story you hear from business owners in, in this industry. Um, as a kid, I started, you know, mowing, mowing lawns, mowing my neighbor's lawns before I even had a driver's license, um, doing yard work, leaf cleanups, that kind of thing. When I when I finally got my driver's license at 16, I started hauling a push mower around in the in the trunk of my Pontiac Grand Prix. It was my kind of my mowing rig. I was uh I was that guy that all the other contractors hated because I had no overhead, probably wasn't paying taxes, that kind of thing. Statute of limitations is up, so I think I can say that it was a long time ago. Um but, uh, you know, that kind of snowballed and culminated into my senior year of high school. I actually went to work for another very reputable uh, landscaping company in Mankato here and uh, learned a lot uh, that, that summer working there on their hardscape crews, you know, learning how to do retaining walls, patios, stuff that I had not had experience with. You know, previously I had done a little bit of, you know, landscape bed work, edging, rock, mulch, that kind of thing, but I hadn't done any hardscape work. So, I was able to learn fairly quickly there. And uh, ironically, uh, I guess I didn't do a good job because the next summer they didn't ask me to come back. Um, still don't totally know why. I probably I probably didn't work terribly hard. I was more focused on having fun during the summer, you know. So instead of uh, doing that, um, I uh, started up my own, officially started up my own business with a, a, a college friend of mine um, doing retaining walls, patios. And then we continued doing our lawn care. Um, naturally winter rolled around and we wanted to keep making money. So we bought a old pickup and, uh, it was a 1986 Ford F-350 with a Henniker straight blade on it and, uh, became a snow removal company, right? Doing, uh, mostly driveways, alleys, you know, we weren't doing any big commercial stuff at the time. And then of course, you know, going through my college years, I did, did go to four years of college and, and graduated. I did that for my parents. I don't know that I necessarily would have done it for myself after seeing what I could do on my own, but did it anyway. Had a good time. Don't regret it besides the amount of money it cost. Um, But after I graduated 2010 from college, the economy was pretty down. Uh, I didn't think that getting a job made a lot of sense. I was doing pretty well with the landscaping and snow work. I'd also uh, invested in some uh, rental properties and was doing the landlord thing, you know, kind of diversifying and, um, uh, so in 2010 is when I would say we officially started being a real company, you know, started doing everything the way we should be doing it. And, and, uh, that timing hit almost perfectly with economic growth in the entire country, but especially here in Southern Minnesota, Mankato, Minnesota in particular, I think it's still top five fastest growing micropolitan areas in the, in the country. So, um, taking advantage of all that real estate development uh, and, and, you know, really growing the landscape side of our business and in conjunction, growing the snow side of our business. Um, 
and I'm talking a lot, so cut me off if you have any questions. But, uh, you know, so we, we rolled that into, obviously, again, we're doing snow. Uh, I, I realized pretty quickly that, at least in our market, that's where the money really was. Um, our snow operation was always very profitable, even when we were small. And there was a really good opportunity locally here for kind of a staple signature um, company. Uh, Rolls-Royce owns a industrial generator division here in Mankato, Minnesota. Um, so they build like, you know, generators big enough to power entire small cities or hospitals or corporate campuses in case of power outages. And uh, they were putting their snow services and lawn services up for bid. And we really probably weren't qualified based on the size of the account and, and based on the um, uh, expectations. But I was determined that this was going to kind of be our signature. And we had been using some liquids in our operation, some some liquid de-icing technology in our in our snow operation, just kind of experimenting with it, starting to get the hang of it. So we pitched them on a all liquid scope of work where we wouldn't be using any salt, any rock salt on their property. And that really hit home with them because the generators they sell are quarter million plus dollars a piece and they don't want salt touching those things. Um, their their facilities pristine, you know, they're a, a German owned uh, company and they take great pride in their the way their facilities look. To the point where even after a snowstorm, they make us haul the snow piles away so that the front of their building is not obstructed by snow piles. I mean, that's the kind of level of work they expect there. Um, so we were able to sell them on that, that all liquid, chloride reduction, environmentally friendly, um, you know, no tracking their buildings, uh, forklifts not sliding around, bumping into stuff. And, and that's the way we got in the door with them. And they've, they've kind of been our building block. So they, again, they kind of became our signature client. Um, we really started focusing and growing our commercial snow operation by using that liquid differentiator. And we could always point at that account and say, if you want to know what your lot can look like, check out this one. And, and that would inherently let the client know that we can handle their site because this is probably one of the bigger, more complex sites in our market. Um, so that's kind of how, how the snow side snowballed. Um, now, again, with that, we're using a lot of liquid. So we keep making a better and better mousetrap per se, a better sprayer, better brine maker. Um, and in 2014, um, David Voigt, my business partner at VSI, uh, was was one of my landscape foremen. Um, had a very talented, brilliant mind when it came to uh, engineering, designing, finding a you know a better way, uh, building a better mousetrap. So I kind of challenged him with, what if we start a new business together called we called it VSI manufacturing this liquid de-icing equipment let's tell our story let's let's help other contractors understand um you know how this is working for us and how it can work for them uh and, and i knew there's a lot of potential but at the same time with any new idea especially something so far outside of what we're used to doing there's a lot of risk involved like you know i'm taking one of my best foremen who are very hard to find i'm going to move him over to this new facility building this product that we don't have any customers for yet so we, we took a pretty big gamble. And again, I, I had a, a good hunch it would work out, but I didn't know quite how well it would work out. And it, it, and it has. And liquids are growing like crazy. Um, you know, chloride reduction, um, scope of work that's being drawn up by these larger companies that want chloride reduction. They want less tracking their facilities, less facility maintenance, um, you know, less corrosion, less infrastructure damage. I mean, there's a lot of drivers towards liquid. Uh, but we, again, just like the landscape business, we kind of hit the timing just right. We, we got in before most contractors even knew how to use liquids, let alone um, implementing them in their business. So kind of hit that early adopters uh, phase, and then that turned into the early majority phase, and that attracted the attention of a company like like Boss Snowplow, obviously a giant in the snow industry. And they knocked on our door with a pretty uh, um, nice proposition of partnering up and you know allowing us to use their very well-established sales channel, distributor network, support network, um, their manufacturing expertise, their buying power. I mean, there's a lot of advantages to partnering up with someone like that. But we structured a really nice deal in which we still maintain a lot of the, you know, FaceTime and, and uh, personal touch we've been able to offer in terms of customer service with BSI. Um, they've really done a nice job uh, with letting us run with what we're good at, but also letting us leverage the resources that they have. So, that kind of kind of brings us up today. We do still have our snow operation. Uh, we did recently, um, actually, just back in August, we did sell the green side of our our of that business. Um, simply, was too busy and and it was kind of a distraction to be honest. Uh, and we had some great people and, and great clients and great accounts and 
So a couple of the employees purchased that that side of the business from me. I did maintain the snow business just because it's such a vital part of what we've done. Um, and we continue to use that snow business for R&D testing on the, not only the VSI liquid de-icing products, but also the Metal Plus uh, snowplow products that, that you see all over LinkedIn and, and everywhere else. Great story. I love it. I love the journey. Stories, you know, help amplify our message, connect with customers and actually close deals. So that's a it's a great Great story. Um, when you think about the snow, you had an interesting comment earlier. Um, you know, when did you know it was a, a real snow removal business? So there's a lot of contractors out there that it, we kind of chuckle when you said we had a truck and a snow plow and we thought we were a contractor. So for the people that out there that are maybe just looking versus the snow pros, just kind of paint the picture of what's what's different and and how do you get to that level? Yeah, yeah. I think I think for us it, it was a few different things. Um, you know, there's there's really two different sides of snow. You have your your residential side where you're doing driveways, um, uh, driveways, alleyways, that kind of thing. Um, you have kind of your I call it a tweener uh, type account where it's like HOAs, which are kind of like commercial accounts, but they're really still residential and you're still dealing with crabby homeowners who are upset that you missed, you know, a little swipe of snow. And then you have your true commercial stuff, but that also splits into two pieces where you have your, your, your subcontracted brokerage type accounts where you're, you're working for a national company that has the account, even though they're based, you know, somewhere a thousand miles away. And then you have your self-performing snow. And I think where the transition happened for us is, is when we started really focusing on, you know, drafting our own contracts, our own scopes of work, um, you know, working directly with these clients, not working for brokers or nationals, um, really dialing in our residential to the point where all we had left a couple of years ago was just the big HOAs, hundred plus driveway type HOAs, and even even that, good money but big distraction. Let's focus on the commercial, industrial. Um, you know, we we do some big box uh, just because the size of our market doesn't allow us to do industrial only. Um, but I, we do really like those industrial sites. They're, they're challenging, which is a good thing. Um, that means they typically pay well. They're not something that truck and a truck can handle. You have to have sophisticated, um, logistics. You have to have operational people. You have to have good planning. You have to be able to pivot quickly. I mean, it's not, it's not just doing driveways. You, you are, you are the reason that a company that's doing millions of dollars of revenue per day either, either runs or doesn't. You know, that's that's a that's a big deal. So I think when we started really focusing on those type of accounts and when we started drafting our own proposed scope of work um, and, and, you know, having more in-depth contracts and, and um, self-performing, uh, obviously, all of our work, but but not working for brokers or subcontracting for anyone, that's when it really felt like we really turned um, turn the corner and, and um, it, it's, it's reflected in our books, too. I mean, we, we make a nice, healthy profit margin. Um it's less stressful than it used to be. We're not dealing with the residential complainers who complain about everything. Um, don't get me wrong. There's guys that crush it with residential snow. We actually did really well too. It was hard to give them up from a profit standpoint, but uh, from a focusing on what we're good at standpoint, it was a good move for us. When we look at brine, I'd like to do a little bit of education on the brine process because it's an up and coming thing. More and more people and contractors are becoming aware of it. They have a lot of questions. They don't know when it can be used. What's its application? Do I need to get rid of rock salt entirely? Is it more cost effective? I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So I just want to take this opportunity to just kind of do maybe a little bit of a knowledge dump in an education session for somebody that's maybe considering it, somebody that's dabbled with it, and just kind of dump some information where people can make better decisions uh, for the environment, for their customers, um, and get the right equipment. Right. For sure. So there's a lot of moving parts here, but uh, first and foremost, I would say that it it's never a good idea to, to do a wholesale change of your entire operation in one season. It, it's There's too much learning. There's too much knowledge, education um, required to succeed with liquids to, to have that be sustainable. You could end up with a perfect winter where you don't have... Um, you know, the type of events where liquids don't perform as well, and you might do great. The next season might be so bad that you lose accounts because your liquids, you didn't know what you're doing, and you didn't perform well. So first and foremost, we, you know, we say don't eat the elephant. You start small, start simple. 
Um, our, our simplest way to, to message that has been to say, start with sidewalks. That was another big reason for the boss partnership is, is, you know, they have a great product in the snow Raider and now the snow SR mag where, you know, it's changing the way that we're doing sidewalks. Let's change it even further and let's just focus on using liquids on our sidewalks. Once you get that dialed in, sidewalks are a lot easier to dial in than parking lots because you're always, you know, if you're a good contractor, you're always giving a high level of service on sidewalks. Whereas what we've seen and what we've learned in the industry is that guys really like just dumping salt and burning stuff off. And I understand why. Labor's short. Um, logistics are are time consuming, complicated. It's a lot easier to send out ten salt trucks than a hundred loaders and plows and trucks, right? So we see a lot of guys that push the envelope on how much snow and ice they're burning off. And I think, again, I understand why they're doing that. Um, that's not a situation where liquid's your best option. Like if 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 one of the main questions we get is, can I go burn off an inch of snow with liquid? The technical answer is yes. Liquid melts snow just like salt but it takes all the efficiency away from using liquid because when you put down a liquid, you're putting down something that's 77% water, water acts as a carrier. So again, a little bit of a science lesson here. When you spread rock salt, all you're doing is making liquid on the ground. So, so using liquid and using salt are not drastically different things. They're, they're simply a different mode of operation. So when, when a, 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 a when a, a granule of rock salt hits a patch of ice, let's say it's a patch of ice, it hits right there. That creates an endothermic reaction with that ice and snow. That creates a puddle of brine, salt brine, which spreads. When that puddle spreads, you have a patch of bare pavement. When all of the granules of salt have puddles that spread far enough to connect together, now you have a bare parking lot. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so, scientifically speaking, uh, you know, assuming average or normal conditions, it only takes 160 to 200 pounds of rock salt to melt off and make a safe service um, on an acre of pavement. And the problem is that at 160 pounds an acre, each granule of salt is about 10 inches apart. So for those brine puddles to spread, you know, that far and connect together, make a bare patch of pavement, that probably takes 24 to 48 or even more hours, depending on sun conditions and temperature. There's no good client in the world that's willing to wait that long for safe service. And we can't risk it as contractors due to the slip and fall liability. So what happens is the, the national average from what we can gather, the data we've done our best to gather, is that the average contractor is putting down between 600 and 1,000 pounds per acre. And that over application is not due to a scientific need. It is due to a science, due to a need for speed. We need to get those parking lots safe more quickly. So now at 1,000 pounds an acre, each annual salt is about an inch and a half, a little less than an inch and a half apart. Now those puddles only have spread this far. It takes you know two hours. That's what we need. That's what we want. By putting down liquid as a post-treatment, what we're doing is we're skipping that phase change where the salt turns into a brine puddle. We're just applying the puddle right to the pavement. That's why when you look at liquid application rates, they're typically between 80 and 100 gallons per acre for a post-treatment. Um, each, each gallon of brine has just over two pounds of salt in it. So that puts you right in that scientifically acceptable range of 160 to 200 pounds. So the reason you're saving salt is because of the the mode of application um so now back to the original question that sparked all this can i burn off an inch of snow yes but what you're putting down is 77 percent water and an inch of snow has a lot of water in it already that creates more rapid dilution so if you're going to go burn off an inch of snow it's probably going to take four to five hundred gallons an acre of salt brine and four to five hundred gallons an acre of salt brine is the same cost as 800 to a thousand pounds of salt the problem is you just spent a lot more labor because what you're carrying, again, is 77% water instead of just a concentrated salt product. So one of the big changes that we have been pushing with contractors, and one of the reasons we got into selling the Metal Plus snow plows at the Live Edge, is that mechanical removal is incredibly important when it comes to succeeding with liquids. So backtracking a little bit, the most common way you see contractors and municipalities and states using liquid is as a pre-treatment. So that's when you're putting the brine down before the snow comes. The point of that treatment is not necessarily to prevent accumulation. The point of that treatment is to prevent the bond of that accumulation with the pavement. So when cars are tracking over it and people are walking over it, it's preventing that bond. The analogy we use is like a frying pan. If you have a, let's say you have a cast iron pan that's not nonstick and it's not seasoned. If you cook an egg on that thing, it is going to stick to that pan so bad that you're going to have a mess to clean up. Putting butter in that pan first or seasoning that pan first, the, the egg's going to peel right up. It'll be clean. 
Same thing goes for pre-treat. It's like buttering a frying pan before you cook in it. You pre-treat your parking lot. It's going to help prevent that bond, make your mechanical removal more effective. Um, so a lot of it comes down to education, you know, so changing the way that contractors operate and the way that they dispatch. And, and, and that's challenging, like, especially for big companies, for a company that is set up to go out and salt at an inch and all of a sudden tell them, no, you need to pre-treat that probably going to prevent a quarter to a half inch of that accumulation. Now you have a half inch left. You still need to go plow that too. And then you can liquid the ice on the back end. That's a major, major change. But the reason that we're pushing for that change and the reason that we're having good success with, especially the smaller companies, like the, the you know, companies with three to 30 employees um, is because they're able to pivot and make that change more easily than a giant company with hundreds and hundreds of, of employees. Um, but the reason we're pushing for that change is because if, if you don't do it now, the government's going to dictate that you do it later. Chloride pollution, pollution is one of the most hot button topics in many, many states right now. Minnesota is a really big one, actually. And right now, salt's not really very regulated. But what we're what we're seeing is there actually is some legislation that's passed in some East Coast states. Um, I believe New York, uh, Connecticut, Vermont, New Hampshire um, and Maryland have passed some form of legislation um, regulating salt use for municipalities. So it's starting on the government level. So do as we um, do as we say, or, or do as do as we do. I should say is what they're moving towards. So they, well, we've been using liquids for five years. You contractors now need to start using it. Um, but what I think we're going to see is we're going to see salt starting to be regulated a lot, like fertilizer and herbicide is. There's going to be logbooks. There's going to be environmental packs on these products. There's going to be licensing required to use them, and you're not going to be able just to go and dump a thousand to two thousand pounds an acre on a on a parking lot just because it's the easiest, fastest way. You're going to have to use best practices to help reduce that salt. And it, it is a really important thing. I'll, I'll be the first to admit I'm, I'm not a, I'm not, I wouldn't call myself an environmentalist at all. I've actually had people say, well, you know, you seem like, you seem like your politics are pretty this way, but you're not, you're talking about the environment. Well, drinking water is pretty important. I also like fishing and hunting and, and that's pretty important to preserve our lakes and, and wetlands. Um, but drinking water, especially, right. If we have, if we have polluted, drinking water there are literally municipalities in the u.s where they cannot drink the water right now because the chloride pollution that's a big deal um so whether you are an environmentalist or not you know drinking water is important whether you like hunting and fishing or not it would kind of be a shame to see all of our lakes turn into an environment where fish and, and wildlife can't live because we already have some of those in minnesota we have in particular a lake in the metro area minneapolis st paul where there's almost no fish left because there's so much chloride pollution and once that pollution is there, it's almost impossible to remove. Um, uh, just a quick stat, uh, one teaspoon of salt permanently pollutes five gallons of water. So if you think about a V-box salter, how many teaspoons are in that thing? I don't know the number. I would guess it's a couple million teaspoons. So take that times five. That's how many water gallons of water we're permanently polluting. Um, so something that's coming. I mean, whether we like it or not, uh, the government will regulate and there will be rules around salt so let's get ahead of the curve and i'm not i'm not suggesting anyone again goes overnight and switches to liquids but um, don't eat the elephant start somewhere start getting comfortable with liquids in the process so that you're not totally totally lagging behind in five to ten years when you're required to so one of the things that people would say or maybe a major major objection or question either or and not that this should be but it, it's a number one or yep. top one would be the revenue. So contractors, a lot of times dump the salt, like you referred, it's a big revenue driving activity. So how does that play for somebody that says, Hey, I don't want to lose this revenue of burning off salt and doing this and that. Are you able to charge the same or, or, you know, what have you found or, or what can you, um, you know, share to somebody that's having that concern? Really, really great question and, and a really great point and great topic. A um, couple ways to look at this. Um, the first one is that I, I always believe in in doing what's best for the client is, is going to be the best thing long term, whether it generates an extra dollar or not. I find that contractors that gouge here and there um, to make an extra buck typically don't have long term success. There, there's some out there. I mean, there's some guys that are just really good at, at uh, playing those games, but I Anytime you play games, you're 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 bound to lose at some point. 
So doing it right by your clients, by doing things the most fair and ethical and honest way is typically the best policy. But the bigger part of it, again, goes back to education. So there's some really interesting information coming out, and we're, and we're really seeing a push on the facilities um, management side where they're they're actually researching the effects of chloride damage on their properties. And they're they're realizing really quickly that it costs them a lot more money to maintain a property that's oversalted over the course of 30 years than it does just to hire a responsible contractor who doesn't use excess salt. So there's multiple sources for, for this information, um, but but the general consensus that that has been able to be proven and shown is that each ton of salt that's applied on a commercial property uh, or a roadway causes between $800 and $3,000 of infrastructure damage long-term. So if you put that into perspective and think about the fact that as a contractor, let's just say national average, you're charging $400 a ton applied for salt. So you're charging your client 400 bucks. That's nothing compared to what it's costing them in long-term infrastructure cost and damage because that infrastructure cost and damage again this is this is concrete asphalt underground plumbing light poles um, building facades landscaping turf um, rugs carpet uh, flooring anything that salt damages which salt damages everything um, it, it, it costs them way more to repair that stuff and maintain it because of salt damage than what they're actually paying the contractor to do the work so now all of a sudden you educate your clients on on this and you, you give them a pitch and say, hey, I'm going to reduce the amount of salt on your property by 50% by using best practices liquid, um, better scraping snow plows. Um, you know, we're not going to let snow accumulate and, and pack down. We're going to pre-treat and prevent that bond. And by doing that, we're going to prevent, you know, eliminate or reduce the salt usage on your property by 50%. Your property is estimated to use 100 ton a year. We're going to knock that down to 50 50 times even the $800 minimum is 40 grand a year we're saving you in long-term fluoride damage. So I am actually the cheapest contractor, even though I'm not the cheapest on paper. It doesn't always work. Don't get me wrong. It, it doesn't always work, but I've been, I feel like I've been talking about this for four or five years now. And, and it's not just me. There's many people that are advancing this mission, but I, I'm actually starting to see this cited in, in scopes of work from big, big companies. I can't, give details because it's still um, uh, uh, not public, but there's a very large well-known company in the U.S. that's launching a pilot program where they're requiring the use of liquids on their properties because of this data. So they don't necessarily care if their contractor is the most expensive. They Their theory is that by reducing chlorides by 50% or more, that they're saving more money in long-term infrastructure costs than the scope of work costs them. So we're seeing it more and more. And I think when this company, uh, when this becomes public and people hear that this company is, is requiring the use of liquids on their properties, that's going to create a domino effect with other companies because that's just the way things work. Right. So I, I think beyond the legal environmental side, there's just, a, there's going to be a demand side to this stuff. There's going to be clients demanding that their contractors do things a better way and that they don't oversalt and that they don't, charged by the pound or by the ton because they don't want over application of salt on their properties. We're also seeing legislation um, like the ASCA is doing some great work on legislation reform, um, limiting the liability of contractors because liability is one of the main reasons cited for oversalting. Like why did you oversalt so much? Because I don't want to get sued. I don't blame any contractor for that. We need to reform legislation so that there's a reasonable time window in which we can melt off a property and not get sued for a slip and fall. Because if the only expectation is that no one slips ever, then the level of service provided is going to be dump salt, dump salt, dump salt, and that's it. So legislation reform, um, government uh, reform and legislation, and then cu customer demand is where we're really seeing this, this pull. For those contractors that are worried about that revenue loss, I, Honestly, I really encourage the pitch, like the pitch that using less is better. Like by us uh, applying less salt, we're actually going to save you more money than you're spending with us. Um, uh, a little micro example of that is another one of our sort of signature staple clients is, is Johnson Outdoor. They manufacture Minn Kota trolling motors and uh, hummingbird fish finders, a bunch of other products like that. Um, 
they had a contract that was quite a bit cheaper. We had been trying to get that place for years and the, the facility maintenance guy is like, yeah, but you know, you guys seem great. And then, you know, uh, Rolls Royce looks great. It's right across the street, but you're just so much more expensive. I said, oh, how about this? I will guarantee no landscape or turf damage. And if there is, I will pay for the, the cost of repair. Cause I noticed that they were having dead grass along all their sidewalks and all their curb lines every single year. And I, I knew the contractor for what they were charging couldn't have been getting paid or couldn't have been doing that repair for free. Um, and he said, well, that would, you know, that would make you cost about the same as them because I'm spending X per year on that repair. Well, by using liquids and by using less chlorides, we don't have dead grass and we don't have dead landscaping. I'm not saying we never cause plow damage because we do. Everyone causes plow damage, but we don't have that chloride damage, which is a lot more expensive to fix. So that differentiator got us in the door with that account and we've had it ever since. So it, it again, it comes down to education. It comes down to being creative. It comes down to, to doing things a better way. And back to my original point, I, I just honestly believe that that doing things the best possible way is always the best way to sustain your business and grow it long term. I love the education part because contractors rush so many times to just get a quote out and they really think they're different. This is a pet peeve of mine is, is working with contractors all across the country and everybody thinks they're different. But what I heard you say is different. It's actually an education of why they should select you. So I, I would encourage anybody that's listening to this, whether it's landscape or snow or a different business, to go back and listen to that and understand how to bring solid data. It's Seth. Uh, there is money waiting to be in your bank account. I know this sounds crazy, but I've found this over and over for people that have used my scaling scoreboard. When business owners I work with implement this tool, they improve their cash, people, and processes. The weight of business is lifted and freedom and financial independence follows. I made a tool on my site that helps you identify exactly how much money the scaling scoreboard can add to your bank account based on your revenue. Go to bluecollarbusinesscoach.net, click on the scoreboard calculator to see how much keeping score will put in your bank account. If you have questions about my scaling scoreboard, set up a time to chat. I love talking business. I'm cheering for you. Now, back to the show. Information that wants, that will make the client want to select you and work with you. The research, having how it's costing them in the long term, having the effects. This is education is driving it forward. And I really love what you did there. And it's super powerful because that's what more contractors need to do in any industry to, um, you know, to help out. The customer needs to know why them. And to be honest, contractors really struggle to answer that question. What makes them different? So right. great job. I really love that, you know, that explanation. I want to look at, um, there's a couple different ways to to price. We have, you know, annual, we have per push, we have seasonals, um, there's hybrid models, there's all a bunch of different things. Can you share any insight to that, you know, maybe best practices, how it works with the brine? You know, we talked a little bit about having to change your model with more maybe more service or or some different things. So what are some of the best practices and best avenues of how to price this for those clients? Yeah, it's awesome. Great question. And that's another, um, you know, in line with your last question, it's another challenge for contractors looking to get into liquids is how do I fit this into the way I price my work? Because if I go in with a proposition of, you know, pre-treating with liquid every time and the client's paying for it, they're going to see that as an extra cost. So again, the education on how that pre-treatment is going to reduce our back-end salting or liquid treatment by 30 to 60%. That's going to not necessarily mean that we're going to lower the price of our post treatment, but it does mean we're going to use a lot less salt and you're not going to have the dead turf and the dead landscaping and the infrastructure damage. Um, furthermore, though, I, you know, bigger picture, uh, broader picture here, I'm a, I'm a really big fan of, of longer term um, seasonal contracts uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Um, the first reason is that it, it does eliminate the greed culture of over application to, to drive revenue. Um, it does, uh, get to an extent, get rid of the culture of, you know, being dishonest about how many hours were worked on sites to, to make extra revenue. Cause I, I see that all the time. I, 
I see, I see hourly rate sheets where, you know, there's 60 bucks an hour for a truck it, with an operator. It costs more than that to run it, but it's obvious what they're doing. If they're staying in business long-term, because there's companies that have been charging that rate for 20 years, it's because they're doubling or tripling their billing to the customer. Um, we've actually had a couple where we went in and we don't like to do hourly. There's a few sites we have to just because that's the only way that they'll let us price it. Um, we went in there hourly and we're using these metal plus plows. Uh, of course, we're charging a higher rate because we're twice as productive. So we're there's an asterisk on a rate sheet saying, yeah, we're 500 bucks an hour for a loader. But we will guarantee that we will be twice as efficient as your previous provider or we'll cover the difference. And that we've never had anyone come back on that and, and dispute otherwise. Um, but we've, we've gone into these sites and, and, and uh, uh, you know, done the first storm and we send out the bill and, and the client says, well, you know, the other guy used to bill me for 17 to 20 hours and you're only at six. Like, well, yeah, that's because we're being honest with our rates. That's why we're charging so much more per hour because we're charging you for what we're actually doing. Um, so I, I like seasonal contracts. So it, it gets rid of that um, that uh, avenue for dishonesty and, and for uh, manipulation of pricing. I also like it because I feel that it's best for the contractor and for the client. So, you know, much like contractors deal with cash flow concerns and issues, especially in the off off season. Um, so do our clients, like whether we, whether we think so or not, the, these are all businesses that are trying to grow and make a profit. And, you know, with rare exception, they probably have cash flow ebbs and flows. And if all of a sudden you get a winter that's triple the snow of normal, or you end up with two or three nor'easters that that literally quadruple or quintuple their budget, they probably don't have the cash flow to sustain that payment. Now, of course, with the seasonal contract, we can't take the risk as contractors in that either. There has to be some stipulation. But if we can get our clients to commit to a three to five year agreement, over the course of five years, you're almost always going to meet the average. You know, you're going to have a year that's up here and a year that's down here and three that are in the middle. And over the course of five years, everyone comes out equal. Um, I feel it's better for the contractors, cash flow and budgeting and planning. I feel that that's better for our clients. I also feel like it creates a lot less dispute on invoicing. Like, I don't know how many contractors you work with that complain their clients don't pay their bills on time or they're disputing invoices or, um, you know, they're, they're spending so much time revising invoices. It's, it's because of the way that, that they're doing, they're billing it and doing it. And I'm not saying that's always wrong. I think some T and M and some hourly can be a good revenue booster. Um, you know, like with our Rolls Royce contract, a lot of that stuff's T and M and hourly, cause they ask us to do the most bizarre things. Like one day we're doing a normal scope of work. The next day they ask us to shell the snow off the roof. I can't, I can't bid that. Like I, I don't have any way to bid that cause I don't know what they're going to ask me to do. Um, but when possible, I, I, I just, I have the strong, uh, strong feeling that it's best for, for all parties to look at seasonal type contracts with, with a floor and a ceiling so that if you do get those rare years where you're way outside the average that you either get compensated for it or the client gets compensated for it. That's great insight on that. For somebody that's looking to get into the liquid de-icing and I know there's all different size companies. But is there any idea of like how it comps? Is it similar cost to getting a, um, you know, a bulk salt spreader or, you know, something like that? Or is there a price point that they should be thinking about just just starting? And I'm not necessarily talking about a company that has, you know, trucks everywhere, but somebody that's considering this or maybe wanting to dabble in it. You know, what would you say just as maybe a rough guide? Yeah, that's an awesome question too. And, and I'll be very transparent that typically speaking, a liquid sprayer is going to be quite a bit more expensive than a salt spreader. And one of the big reasons for that is because of the technology that you can implement with a salt spreader. So I think the best analogy is like if you look at a company like Hilltip, what they do with their salt spreaders, they sell $20,000 salt spreaders, um, but they do a lot more than a $6,000, you know, poly V box. Um, with sprayers, you can do the same thing. You can buy a six thousand dollars sprayer. It's going to be on-off control only, no rate control. It's just going to spray liquid on the ground. That can work perfectly fine in the right situation. Um, in fact, BSI sells a line of sprayers called the Genesis line. It's literally an on-off product line. There's no rate control. There's no tracking. It's just literally you're either spraying or you're not. There's one switch. Um, and, and for small parking lots like like banks, Starbucks, you know, small strip malls, those work perfectly fine. But you get on some of these big box stores and industrial sites, we need to have a lot higher level of control. Um, 
liquid's not as easy to visually tell how much you're putting down. So not having rate control can be a big problem if you don't, if you're applying lots and lots of gallons. You can kind of eyeball salt. Like you can look and see like, okay, you know, that looks like my typical spread. Like that looks pretty good. You can't really eyeball liquid unless it's physically like going down the storm drain because you put so much down. You're not really going to be able to tell if you're over applying unless you have that rate control system. So again, on small parking lots, you know that your on-off sprayer is perfectly calibrated for eight miles an hour. Just go eight miles an hour. You're good. You get on an industrial site, you need to be covering a lot more than eight miles an hour, eight feet wide. Otherwise, a 10-acre site is going to take six hours to apply. You can't, you just can't do that. So apples to apples, it costs similar. Um, generally speaking, the feedback we get is, well, I can buy, you know, two or three salt spreaders for the price of one of your sprayers. You're not wrong. You can. If you look at our legacy sprayer versus a commoditized salt spreader, you're you're absolutely right. Another reason for this price gap, beside the technology, is just again the the commodity um, phase. You know when when electric uh, uh, when electric salt spreaders first hit the market and replaced gas, like they were insanely expensive because it was the new thing. It was not commoditized yet. Once you get Douglas and Boss and and all these other guys. Um, uh, fighting over that same market share, guess what happens? The price gets driven down. Now that we're starting to see liquids become, they're not commoditized yet. They're still in that kind of that early majority phase. But once we see that hit the maturity market phase, you're going to see a lot more competition. That's going to make the technology more available. Um, that's going to drive prices down as well. So as odd as that sounds to talk about in this market and economy, prices going down, it just, it's the product life cycle. Like the first DVD player that ever came out was like $30,000 because it was a DVD player. Um, they certainly came down in price, right? Because they went from being the new kid on the block to a commodity product. And you'll see the same thing with liquid sprayers. So they are expensive right now. I mean, to get into like a flatbed, let's say F550 flatbed size unit, you're probably looking at 20,000 bucks, which is probably double of what a, four to, a three to four yard spreader would cost. Or maybe even more than that, depending if you go stainless or poly. Um, uh, you also have the cost of buying the brine maker and setting up the storage tanks. Um, now, when you look at the actual ROI, if you actually you know look at the return on investment of implementing liquids in your business, it pays for itself really fast. But from a pure dollar for dollar purchasing standpoint, the liquid stuff's going to cost quite a bit more. You mentioned metal plus and this combination of the live edge. I'd like you to just explain a little bit what the live edge is, what the metal plus is, what it does and why it's a good combo with the brine. Yeah. Awesome question. So um, just to, to give a high level overview, uh, we, we run our, our businesses on a, a platform called EOS. I think I actually commented that on one of your, uh, your uh, poll questions. Um, and, and in EOS, you always have kind of a model that you live and die by, and, and it's supposed to be one sentence, super simple. So at, at, at VSI, which is now split into two parts to the boss, you know, we got VSI and storm or VSI by boss and storm equipment, but our motto was a better way to bear pavement. Anything that helped us create a better way to bear pavement fit our business model and our plan. If it did not meet that, then it didn't fit. So like, for example, um, could we have built and sold salt spreaders? Absolutely. We didn't necessarily feel that that fit the big picture of a better way to bear pavement because salt spreaders have been around for a long time. It, 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 they work great. They're fine, but it's not something new. It's not innovative. It's not a new and better way to bear pavement. So that's kind of how we we structured um, uh, everything that we did and, and, and everything that we moved towards. So we often got asked, you know, if you're a manufacturer of liquid de-icing equipment, why are you also distributing someone else's Metal Plus snowplow product? Well, the, the, the long answer is that we met them at a trade show. They happened to be across the aisle from us at GIE back in 2016. Um, and they kind of forced me into buying the plow out of their booth because they didn't want to have to haul it back to Canada. I'll be honest, I was a little skeptical because the cost was 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 high compared to what I was used to. I was, I was buying a lot of Hineker and Cage plows, plows at the time. Again, a more commoditized type plow product. You know, I was paying probably 5000 bucks for a, for a pickup plow and 6000 bucks for a, a skid loader or a loader uh, push box. But all of a sudden, they're saying, well, like, yeah, you know, give you a trade show special, $14,000. It's like, what? <laughs> okay. 
But I did it anyway because it looked like it was really well built. They were really nice guys, and I thought, what the heck, why not? Um, so we took this thing back to Minnesota and uh, put it in the hands of one of our best operators, and, and you know we tracked all of our production rates and our times uh, in, in LMN at the time. We were using LMN for all of our routing and, and tracking, and I was just blown away that all of his times were coming in half of what they were you know, two weeks prior. And so we sat down and I said, is it really, you know, that much more efficient? He's like, man, that, that plow is a game changer. Like I, I can do so much more work so much faster with those hydraulic wings. It scrapes so clean. It's, you know, so the next year we, we turned over our entire fleet. Um, uh, we actually got rid of all of our truck plows and just went loaders, tractors and metal plus plows. And, and by doing that, we were able to achieve, uh, um, the same volume of work with half the machines and people. So again, a better, more efficient way to bear pavement. Uh, going back to the live edge question where this all started, I know I ramble too much, but um, it was an immediate, it's something we immediately noticed is that between pre-treating with a liquid, scraping with a live edge, there were, there were many times where we really didn't even need to use much for post treatment, especially if the sun came out. That quality of mechanical removal coupled with that, again, that pre-treatment, that bond prevention, um, it's just a total game changer. I mean, we we went from, if you look at some of our earlier VSI videos, you'll actually hear us talk about how pre-treatment's not worth your time or your money. Um, it, it wasn't because pre-treatment wasn't worth our time or money. It was because the plows we were scraping with didn't make it worth our time or money. Um it, and I, I would even dispute that, like looking back, you know, we weren't using proper additives with our brine to, to get the best results out of our pretreatment. But, you know, once we implemented those live edge plows, that's when we really, the light bulb went off and went, can we really live in a world without having both of these things together? Because this is the ultimate combination. Um, so that's how we ended up being a distributor for Metal Plus plows. It was the, the live edge and liquid love fest that they work so well together that we got to keep them together. Um Ironically, now they're split apart because we're obviously with Boss on the liquid side and we have the, the Metal Plus uh, plows on the Storm equipment side. But, you know, I'm still coming on, on podcasts like this, doing education and training, and, and Boss has been gracious enough to, to not uh, make me stop talking about the best way to scrape to bare pavement. When you think about the the live edge, and I'm going to – this might be a competitor, uh, you know, at the time, but – when you think about like Arctic or some of those other ones that say they have a live edge as well, or they don't have the wing. So not so much picking fights or anything like that, but more so what is the main difference? Because as a contractor, again, we're trying to share knowledge and say, okay, some of these plows, and there's a lot of different models. I just came up with Arctic because I saw that, but you know, they say they have a live, you know, something, whether it's an edge and then, um, you know, there's just straight boxes. So, you know, I just want to kind of clarify because a lot of people are used to just regular boxes with no fancy things. They don't have any any trip trip things or live edge. And yep. then there's a metal plus that has wings plus the live edge. So from your experience, you know, talking from a regular push box to some of these other things, is there select applications for them or is the metal plus kind of take all of those applications? Um, you know, what have you seen or could share? Yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of like, the liquids discussion every 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 tool has its place um you know our arctic in particular they they make a really good product it scrapes really well uh very well built heavy built solid product um there are situations where push boxes make a lot of sense if you're on a if you're on a site where you have a bunch of nooks and crannies and you're feeding to just a central aisle to push into a pile the machine that's pushing the that that aisle to the pile that a push box works just as well for that. If you're looking to take that same job site and, and eliminate two other machines by becoming more productive with a single hydraulic wing plow, you have that ability. So, and, and don't get me wrong, Metal Plus makes a, a push box, fixed edge push box too. Um, I, I think the biggest differentiator that I've seen uh, between Metal Plus and others is, is you know, their, their patents have disallowed people from copycatting completely. And the copycatting that's happening, um, it, it's not all bad. There's some good stuff out there. It's just, it's not quite as good because they can't quite copy the full design. And a lot of what we're seeing is that Metal Plus, a big part of the way that their um, edge system is designed is it, it uses springs for the flotation, metal springs. 
these other systems are, are using some type of rubber or polyurethane blocking to create that flex. The problem with rubber and polyurethane blocking is that it, Oh, do I still got you? Yep. Yeah. You're Hold on. I lost, I lost my entire screen. Hold on. <laughs> Weird. Sorry. Somehow. Okay. There we go. Sorry. Um, all of a sudden, there was a Microsoft Excel in front of me, and I thought I was booted off. Thought you got sick of me. Um, but uh, one of the problems with the polyurethane and rubber blocking is that number one, it, it's susceptible to wear. Um, not that springs can't wear out, but they sure wear out a lot slower than rubber and polyurethane. The other issue is that in exceptionally cold climates like Minnesota, um, the colder it gets, the less flexible that stuff is. So. What we see in the climates like Minnesota when it's negative 10 is that the edge just doesn't perform the same as it does when it's 30 degrees out. In the Northeast, not as big of a concern because you don't get those sub-zero temperatures very often. In the Midwest, it's kind of a big deal. Like we, we need that performance even more so when it's cold because we have more propensity for bonding to the pavement when it's that cold. Um, so that, that's where I really like, you know, their edge design system. That being said, I, I'm a proponent for any plow system that scrapes better. So that's why, you know, we, we sell against Arctic all the time. I, I, I uh, think they build a great product. Um, I can't even necessarily say that they don't have some things about their product that's actually favorable. Um, the way that they can plow over curbs and stuff is kind of cool. Metal Plus can't necessarily do that. Um, but I'm, I'm a fan of anything that, that scrapes pavement cleaner because that's going to help uh, reduce the amount of salt needed. That's going to help promote liquids further. Um, and that's going to overall better the the cause and the industry and the reputation of the industry. Awesome. One last question. What do you want other contractors, snow contractors to know, or what would be your message? Any advice that you would give them? Yeah, I think, honestly, I think the big thing is just don't do things the way you've always done them. It's super easy. And, and I've, I'm, guilty of it too. I get stuck in a rut of doing things the same way. You know, the definition of insanity is doing the things the same way and expecting a different result, but I, I do it too. But I can say that when we make commitment to doing something different and better, and we really stick to that, even when it's hard, that's when we really see the most material change and the, and the best results. I mean, like the VSI thing, I, I mean, I wanted to give up on that seven different times over the years, just because the core business was the landscaping and snow. That's where the money was coming from. BSI was a cool, shiny object, but it wasn't making any money. It was actually eating money. Um, but in the back of my mind, I knew it was a big opportunity. So we stuck with it and it, it ended up being something way, way bigger. I mean, it's, you know, 400 times the size of what we could do with our local landscape and snow company. Right. So not always just doing things the way you've always done them. Um, think about when it comes to snow, that better way to bear pavement. I don't care if it's with stuff we sell or someone else. Like I said, I think Arctic makes a great product. I think there's other great products out there too. But just don't look at, at just the cost. Like we talked earlier about how liquid equipment's more expensive. Yeah, it is. But it's also a better way of doing things if you implement it properly. Metal plus files are definitely more expensive. Arctic push boxes are definitely more expensive. But it is a better way to provide a higher level of service, to better differentiate, um, and to create a higher return on investment. I mean, you're just, when you stick with it over the long term, this stuff is going to pay dividends. And up front, it can be painful to spend the money and do the training. I mean, like what stakes training, education, training, education. So does using a metal plus plow. Like one of the complaints I hear is like, oh man, there's, there's buttons. I got to move the wings and my guys are too dumb to run them. Well, then train them. I mean, I know that's it's easier said than done because it's hard to find people and then people you train them and they quit and you got to replace them on the spot. I totally get that. But it's all worth the mission of advancing, moving forward and and, and moving towards doing things a better way. Well, this was awesome. The education was great. Spot on data and information. So, Jordan, I really thank you for being a part of the show. Where can people find you, reach out to you, contact you? Yeah. So I'm, I'm on LinkedIn a lot. So, uh, feel free to, to add me on LinkedIn. I, I rarely, uh, deny connections unless you spam me first. Um, then I typically don't accept, but if you say, Hey, I'm a snow contractor, I uh, love to talk. I will add you every time. And I would love to jump on an email or a call and talk anytime. 
Otherwise, uh, visit our website, vsinnovation.com or stormeq.com is our Metal Plus website. Um, otherwise, our phone numbers are published on Google, and you can call there and, and tell them you, you heard Jordan on uh, LinkedIn or on a podcast and you want to talk to him. And um, unless I'm in a meeting, I'll be happy to talk to anyone. Otherwise, Thanks if again. you reach out on LinkedIn, I'll give you my personal cell phone number. You can call me. I'm, I'm, I'm an open book. I love to chat. Awesome. Thanks so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, Seth. Hey, it's Seth. Thanks for listening. For more information about my Blue Collar Mastermind Group, Blue Collar Gear, free resources, or my book, go to bluecollarbusinesscoach.net. You can subscribe, like, and share if you enjoy this. Thanks again.